Harith, really good to have you here. And I think it's, it's a real pleasure to have somebody of your caliber and experience to be here uh, amongst a day where we have heard really notable talks and speeches today. But uh, Harith comes to us, uh, uh, he's on the board of MasterCard. Uh, he's been an ex-partner at Goldman Sachs and most notably was running the Marcus, which is a consumer banking business of uh, Goldman Sachs uh, back then. Uh, he's worked across the continent uh, uh, at, uh, in US clearly, Europe and Asia Pacific. And uh, also, uh, 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 he's also had a lot of uh, built diverse teams in different geographies and so forth. So, Harit, so nice to meet you. Here, have a seat. Thank you very much. It's daunting to be uh, in a group of risk professionals, not being a risk professional myself. But I guess as a business leader, you can't say you're not a you don't understand risk because then that's a bad thing. <laughs> yeah, no. So I remember my first conversation with Harith and he said, so, you know, who's metric stream? Who's, what is risk about? And, what, and, and uh, that was a joke. So he, he basically said this is all in his leadership of innovation. Risk and innovation are kind of flip side of the same coin. And this is what he has practiced throughout his, uh, you know, long journey. And as he has agreed to talk to us today, I think the backdrop that I want to provide here is that we are at an interesting time. I think Gaurav touched upon there are five or six major disruptive events going on, right? You look at the inflation, the war, you know, the, the climate change. You're talking about more amplified risk in terms of just the, you know, the geopolitical stuff, but also regulatory environment, environment and the financial volatility. You look, look at all of this at the backdrop of the pandemic, this is an interesting time in uh, human history. And you go back to, you know, when uh, we first actually created this company, this was back in 2008, 2009, at the advent of the financial crisis back then. And you look at it where we sit here in 2023, there are a lot of parallels to be drawn. So when you're creating, uh, when you're living in a world like this, how do you create organizations which are well-governed, risk-managed and compliant by design? you know, where it is in the DNA of the organization where risk is embedded deep into it and where risk is actually an accelerator of performance, not just a break or not just a way to say no, but to how to help you innovate in these uh, interesting and challenging times. So uh, Harith has a lot of insights on these topics uh, and I would open up with a very simple question, Harith. You have a lot of experiences in over four decades, right, in payment, consumer banking, fintech, and other uh, opportunities in the financial sector. So tell us about what are some of the things that have changed over the last 40 years in terms of consumer behavior as you've seen. Let, let's start with that first. So <laughs> you asked me what's changed over the last 40 years. Um, I guess how much time and how much wine do we have? <laughs> um, no, seriously, it's very difficult to encapsulate a 40-year change scenario. But I would actually say a lot has changed and not much has changed. Um, and it is fashionable to take the technology lens and I think it is the right lens to take, that over the last 30, 40 years, technology, whether you start with now what seems like primitive Excel spreadsheets to now prompt engineers required for generative AI, it has changed everything, certainly in financial services. Uh, Products have changed, services have changed. We know all that, I don't need to talk about it. But I think profoundly the operating models have changed. Uh, even 20 years ago, it was very decentralized. The basic unit was a branch. And inside a branch, everything happened. And good or bad, and we can have debates about it, 
we realize that that is not scalable and that is not efficient and perhaps that is not effective, although I'm not sure. And therefore, there was, from this decentralized banking environment or payments environment, a highly centralized few call centers, few mega platforms, um, overly functionalized. Everybody's given a task to do. And then we say, we've lost connectivity. Obviously, we've lost connectivity. I'm not saying this was wrong, but I think for us not to understand the implications of over-centralized business models, and there's goodness in that, and there is some challenges in that, and you have to address those challenges. Most people in large companies don't know what their organization stands for. They don't understand who are their customers. And what I say when I say not much has changed, I've lived all my life in financial services, I've earned all my livelihood in financial services, but we are a uniquely non-customer friendly industry. If you look at the data, even today 74% of millennials would rather visit their dentist than visit their branch <laughs> because it's such an unpleasant experience. More than 50% of people in USA don't understand the interest rate they're paying on their credit card. More than 50% of the people don't trust their bank or their financial services company because everything has become a black box. And we talk about data and AI, and I'm a big believer in technology, but customer centricity in our industry has not changed. The power in the custom is not with the customer, and the customer does not like that. We make customers sign long forms. Customers sign it, they treat it as a sign of disrespect. And I'm not saying this as an ideological view. I have spent tens of thousands of hours listening to customer focus groups that while a lot has changed in our industry, and I think the most positive change is the democratization of our products and services, but a lot still hasn't changed, and we have a lot more to do. And that's a great insight into the consumer and the, the banking sector at large. So let me ask a question, uh, as you think about the shifting consumer banking and payments and the digitization, right? Maybe you can shed some light on how has risk compliance and governance changed in the last five? I'm not, I'm gonna spare the 40 years to the last five <laughs> and ask, you know, how do you see things coming in the next five? Uh, especially from your vantage point and lens, you know, having run organizations like the Marcus and others, and, and, and how do you see the trend lines on the risk and compliance and governance functions? So the good news and the bad news is it's become more complicated and it's become more important. Why that's good news is, therefore, there's a great demand for risk professionals, and all of you have great job security uh, because it's going to get more and more complicated. Um, I think... In my mind, uh, taking credit card or consumer banking as a uh, uh, example, one of the fundamental changes which happened in 2008 is when the Card Act or the UDAP, and I'm taking that just as an example for a broader thing happened. Because till then, while there are lots and lots of regulations and rules and laws, etc. The defining thing was truth in lending or truth in saving. Are you disclosing to the customer what you are going to do to the customer or what you're going to charge to the customer or what the customer's rights are? And organizations thought that as long as that was clarified, it was okay. 
And with the advent of CFPB, and we may like it or may not like it, but I think a lot of it was self-imposed by the industry, uh, that is no longer adequate. The rule now is, has, the, has a reasonable customer understood it reasonably? Have you clarified in a way which makes sense? Or have you buried it in your terms and conditions? To me, that is a fundamental change and a positive change. Uh, I'm not sitting here either defending or criticizing regulators, but I think that is a fundamental change. I think the second thing which has changed is Reputation matters more today than it did five or ten years ago. Because social media is going to whack you. You know, many years ago, Bank of America uh, made a rule that I forget exactly, it was around 2009 or 10 that if you don't maintain a certain minimum balance on your debit card, you'll be charged $5 a month. Rationally speaking, most banks wanted to do that. Bank of America had the courage to be the first one. They were bombarded with social media for 48, 72 hours. And all the other big banks distance themselves from that policy, whereas I know it for a fact that every single large bank was contemplating and running models about piloting that policy. They distanced themselves, and Bank of America had to change within 72 hours. The same thing to ha happened to Verizon. They had some late fee policy. They got such a whacking on social media. So these are things which when we grew up in risk, we thought only of credit risk models and we thought of only uh, market risk. And all of those are still very important. You know, the different categories of risk. And, but I think that's become very important. The other thing which has become very important is operating risk. Because, you know, when you have, say, credit models, a small group creates credit models. You go through various disparate impact, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But not 10,000 people in your organization create a credit model. But 10,000 people, 20,000 people, 30,000 people in your organization create operating risk. And if you look at consent orders which have happened in the industry, financial services industry over the last 10, 15 years, every single one of those consent order had its roots in a customer complaint in a call center which did not get picked up because maybe it wasn't voluminous enough at that time. But then it's exploded. So I think the way it has changed is that uh, it's become more 360. It's become more shades, more people create it, more people um, control, have to control it. And I think technology is a solution towards that, but it is not the only solution. And as we all know in this room, culture counts for a lot. And I think in the next five years, to, as the cliche which all of us know, uh, AI is going to create solutions and it is going to create problems and we will have to, like a landmine, navigate between the solutions and the uh, challenges and we will have some pitfalls and when there's a pitfall, there'll be a big you and cry that this is all bad and it isn't. Just because there's a flood, you don't stop agricultural farming. Um, but I think learning how to navigate the challenges and minefields of superior and superior technology is going to be important. And, you know, everything's become omni-channel. Customers meet you at different points for the same transaction, and histories don't carry because your data pipes are all corroded. 
and therefore how do you manage that is going to be a challenge. No, great insights and I think I would fully concur, you know, we are entering a unique age, the age of the AI. You know, the next five, ten years, things are going to be dramatically different and the risk profession itself is going to morph. I think we heard a lot of that discussion earlier today. Um, but let me bring the question back to your personal experience as running the, the banking platform, Marcus, at Goldman. So tell us a little bit about what challenges did you face in the onset of this new venture and as a first mover, right, in digital banking, what advice would you give to other organizations looking to diversify their products or service offerings? And uh, do you think the GRC was kind of factored in by design at Marcus, you know, from get-go, or was it something that you layered in as you went along? Sure. Um, I've got to be careful on what I say, how I say, uh, I assume this is not public. Um, yes. So there's been a, recently a lot of um, press articles, some complimentary, a lot not complimentary about Marcus. Uh, I have to claim that I'm not going to talk about that period I left two years ago. So uh, for those who may not know Marcus, Marcus was Goldman's consumer platform. We started in 2016. I left in 21. Uh, in the five years, we were considered the most successful. We created a modern consumer platform. The core of it was customer centricity. Uh, in the first five years, we got around 16 million customers, over $100 billion of deposits, partnerships with Apple, Amazon, $16, $20 billion of consumer assets. The mismatch was deliberate. Uh, we went through regulatory audits, internal, external, everything was fine and we were doing very well. Um, so we started a new fintech inside a 150-year-old investment bank. And when you do that, there are a few things which are important. I think the most important is credibility. You have to build credibility with your internal stakeholders. You have to build credibility with your customers. You have to build credibility with your regulators and you have to build credibility with your shareholders. And I think you do that by having the North Stars of what is it that you're trying to do. And even if your business plan says you'll make money five years later, every week you should know whether you're tracking to that or not. Um, that, I think, credibility in, in any new startup, in any new initiative, whether standalone or inside a large organization, to me, credibility is very important. I think the second thing is, to your question about GRC by design, yes. You know, we could have said consumer business is different from wholesale business. It is. Uh, but we said we will stick by Goldman's uh, governance, whether it is financial, whether it's risk, whether it is cyber, whether it is reputational. But my request was, which was always agreed, fortunately, we must have people who understand our business doing the governance. You can't have an, I, I'm not a medical doctor, but you can't have a nephrologist come and treat you for orthodontics, okay? So very often we think this is a risk professional, put him or her in this risk function. No, you must have expertise. You may be a great risk person for a trading business. You may not be a great risk person for a consumer business or vice versa. So uh, that is very important. So not only did we build the team in what is called the first line, but we helped build the team in the second line and the third line. The other thing which is very important is there's always a debate. You know, the marketing guys don't like the lawyers and the risk people and the compliance people and the risk and compliance people these, say these marketing guys don't understand what they're doing. They're putting the organization to risk. Uh, first of all, these are good, healthy debates. 
uh, shouldn't be personal, but there should always be debates. I think what is important is keeping your product simple. Simple is not easy, but simple is what the customer likes. Apple keeps its product simple. Other technology companies don't keep their product simple. Apple is extremely sophisticated to make it simple. So, I believe strongly that in, you must have products and services which are simple. They will help you grow. They'll help you manage risk. They'll help you understand risk. And you'll always be in a better spot. And I have multiple examples of that. No, that that's a great insight. I, I still remember very early on in the GRC history, we talked about how we need to collectively make GRC simple. And it's been you know, 15 years in the making. We are still making it simple because <laughs> by design, it's complicated. Yeah. And I think there's a lot to be said about keeping things simple. Um, so I have another question for you from your days at uh, Discover. Uh, from 2007 to 2015, as you were the president of the U.S. Cards and chief marketing officer uh, at Discover, tell us about kind of how you saw in that period, especially since the financial crisis was hitting around that period, and uh, and how were you managing risk during that time? Especially you had the chief marketing officer lens at the time, so you're on the other side of the aisle. Yeah, I, I have always been on the same side of the aisle. <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, that was a, now in hindsight, it seems like a wonderful time, but for those of us who lived through that, it was very scary. We all looked death in our face. Um, and the card industry in particular that time went through both cyclical and structural challenges. Cyclical because unemployment went from around 4% to around 12% in the economy. If I have my numbers right, for a roughly 50 basis point increase in unemployment in the economy, at that time, the credit card industry charge-offs would increase by around one to one and a half billion dollars. That was with 50 basis points. Here we went from around 4% to 12%, okay? Capital markets froze. Um, liquidity at a premium. So, tremendous cyclical pressures. Then structural pressures. Uh, accounting rules changed. Regulatory landscape changed. And frankly, most people wondered whether the credit card industry would survive, okay? We, uh, at Discover that time, did pretty well. Uh, our charge-offs were below industry. Uh, we came out of the crisis faster than anyone else. We grew faster than others. We were more profitable than others, and our stock price did, at that time, better than others. What we did at that time was very important from a risk perspective. We were very clear that what is our North Star? And our North Star was that we must stick by our customers and we must emerge competitively stronger. So we had layoffs. Uh, we cut a lot. But we cut in new customer acquisition, we cut in new products, we cut in new initiatives, we cut in head office. We did not cut a single person in the call centers because that's where the customer and customer service matter. We did not, our core product was rewards, cashback bonus. We invested more in cashback bonus. But we cut out many other lines of business. So we stuck to our core. Uh, and the customers rewarded us. So I think when challenges come, it is really an opportunity to define how you, what is your core and how do you stick to your core and give up your bad pet projects. 
Yeah, no, that's well said. So I think the current crisis or the situation that we are seeing with all of the complexities that we talked about, you know, high inflation, you know, geopolitical risks and so forth, I think warrants us all to reflect on exactly what is core and what is non-core. And the sharper your focus becomes on the core, yes. you know, is, is the way to go uh, going forward. Uh, <clears throat> one of the other thoughts that comes to me is, you know, we've talked throughout the day today about the power of connection and that's one of the themes in GRC summit this year. And, uh, as, and the connection, you know, implying the importance of having an interconnected view of risk, not in silos, but where there's an interconnection across different types of risk, whether it's cyber, whether it's, uh, you know, financial or operational or uh, ESG or others for that matter. So uh, maybe if you have a story or an experience from your past, where you've seen the power of that connection or the interconnection between risks that have come to bear. Tell us a little bit about that from your experience. Fortunately or unfortunately, I have dozens of stories. I have a lot of scars on my back. Um, you're 100% right about the issue is connectedness or the interconnectedness and understanding the all the moving parts because People in the credit area are very good in understanding the credit risk. They don't understand the operational risk sometimes in executing those credit models. People in cybersecurity are very important, very knowledgeable about that area, but they may not understand something else. And at the top of the house, you have to worry about everything. Okay. Um, one of the examples I'll give is, this is a discover example. You know, after 2008 crisis, we all learned first line, second line, third line. Uh, before that, I used to take pride in the fact that in discover, we were lean and mean, and there was no difference between first line and second line. And there was business and there was internal audit, and that's about it, okay? And everybody's risk job was risk, and we didn't have well-defined things. And when the regulators wrapped us hard on our knuckles, um, initially I was as the president in a state of denial and arguing with my risk officer. They don't understand what we are trying to do. That's one thing I would say. Don't try and argue with the regulators. I've seen too many times we argue with the regulators. They don't understand our context. It is not their job to understand the context. It is their job to regulate. Just give in, throw the sink, and make sure you do it, OK? So um, uh, we were going to spend a lot of money furthering the first, second, and third line defenses, the interconnectedness. And it was going to cost a lot of money. And to some of us at the senior level, we knew we had to do it, but we were not very comfortable as to how are we going to explain that why are we doing all this to our teams, to ourselves, to our shareholders? Are we just doing it because it's a regulatory requirement and we've got to check the box? Or is there a deeper purpose? And we didn't want to do it just because it's a regulatory requirement and we are checking the box. Because that seemed necessary but not adequate. So that's when we realized that what is the core of our business? It is fundamentally four things. Making promises to customers that are legal, fair, and understood making sure that we have the capacity to fulfill those promises, making sure those promises are well communicated, and making sure we have a way to prove the first three. So only the last part is really a regulatory requirement. The first three parts is what a great business or a great brand should do any which way. So therefore, we were so happy to put in the investments because we could define it in a holistic manner 
rather than just from a risk hat. And that became very galvanizing for the organization. No, I think you, you raise a pretty good point. It's, it's sometimes, you know, we just follow the norm and say that we do something for a regulatory compliance. But it's also important to ask the deeper question is, why are you really doing it? And that why is important, and you probably need to ask that why a few times over. Correct. To get down to a real galvanizing reason for why you know, even though the regulators may be asking for it, you know, maybe there's a deeper reason for why it, what it brings value to the business. And that explanation kind of galvanizes the organization to rally behind it and make it happen. And that can be transformative in Absolutely. terms of the culture and the tone from the top into the organization. So, you know, that's a great and well said that. So, uh, I, I want to just, in, in, in interest of time, I want to open up the floor for questions from the audience here. You know, I, there's a bunch of questions that I've seen here, but why don't we turn over and see if there are some questions from the from the audience? Any questions or comments? Late in the evening. <laughs> no. Okay. So uh, I have one more to go here in terms of. Uh, like you saw some of the events around the Silicon Valley bank crisis recently. So uh, any comment on how do you think of that and you know, kind of the impact of the regional banks uh, and what's ahead of us in terms of uh, the financial markets as you saw the SVB event unfold? You know, there are <laughs> um, better minds uh, who've commented on this and will continue to comment. I would say, first of all, what happened to Silicon Valley Bank and First Republic is profoundly sad. As a person from the industry, these were banks which people were admiring. Regulators had regulated them. Analysts had put them on buy side, you know, ratings. Uh, and yet, it doesn't take an Einstein to figure out, in hindsight, the mismatch in their balance sheet. And that's very, very sad. And if you see over the course of not just Silicon Valley or First Republic, um, you see over the last 30, 40, 50 years, institutions which have had fire sales almost always have had it because of a liquidity issue. And I always say that Credit risk, operating risk, if not managed, are like cancer or diabetes. They will kill you, but they will kill you slowly. But liquidity risks are like a heart attack. Uh, it's a 911 situation. And if you're not healthy, it'll kill you. Um, the other thing, of course, which all of us have talked about, and you know, a lot of people, you guys are from Silicon Valley. Um, I do think there was a certain amount of irrespons irresponsibility on behalf of maybe less than a dozen people. Um, there's no bank which can really survive a run. And um, so it was sad. And I think, to me, the most important lesson for us as business leaders or risk people is nothing is as good as it ever seems. And nothing is as bad as it ever seems. 
And of course, all of you are experts, different shades of wrist, different categories of wrist, different procedures, socks, this, that, etc. But I think, and we also know culture, tonality, tone from the top, all of us have, you know, read the book. I think curiosity is very important. Asking ourselves questions when we are doing well is very important. If we are outperforming the market, we must ask ourselves why. Because we are not more brilliant than others, we don't execute better than others, we must, and yet we want to outperform, so we must understand why, how, curiosity about your performance when you're doing great is very, very key as a business leader and a risk professional. Well, that's, a, that's very well said because oftentimes, you know, you stop asking those questions at that time only to find out later that you went overboard on the quantum of risk that you took. Or non-diversification yeah. or, you know, hedging, we're taking the bet one way. Exactly. And uh, life is not about risk avoidance. Life is about risk management. And the core of risk management is understanding risk. And the core of understanding risk is deep curiosity. No, and I think that's very well said. The curiosity is an important factor. And I think the other point I would, I would highlight from the SBB example here is that, you know, coming back full circle to the, to the age of social media, I mean, we are in a place where good news can traverse really fast, bad news can traverse even faster. And I think it's important to understand that the reputational risks are of paramount importance to pay attention to for brands and not, you know, assume. So what happened there was few people with few tweets can, can absolutely do a run on the bank, and that can happen to any brand, any organization in the modern times. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, at the end of the day, I forget the number, you know, $7 billion, $8 billion loss on the mismatch of the bond portfolio. Terrible, but not the end of the world. Yes. So, uh, so that's, uh, you know, but, but Harit, great conversation and, and uh, I think a lot of great insights. So thank you for coming here. And uh, I wanted to just uh, finish off by just kind of putting some key headlines from the day today. Uh, as I said, you know, we, we've had a very busy day today with a lot of conversations. We started off with a keynote from Gaurav Kapoor, a co-CEO. We talked about, you know, the, the whole connectedness. We talked about how GRC has to become more cognitive, cloud-oriented, and continuous. I think those are the three Cs that are important in this connected world. Uh, we then had conversations uh, from some of our key customers, you know, we 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 heard from uh, from uh, Denata, from Fitch, from uh, also conversations we had around uh, various of the experiences people have had building uh, uh, GRC systems. We we talked through uh, a fireside chat with uh, Gaurav uh, and George Smirnoff. It was fascinating in terms of uh, what was going on at Barclays. Uh, and uh, some of the key experiences from Barclays on how they have managed their operational risk. Uh, what was also fascinating was going back into a product discussions that we had subsequently, which Prasad and Joy and Raghu kind of led, and we touched upon kind of how we're moving into this age of AI and more cognitive, more continuous, more cloud-oriented GRC, and especially the one where you're doing least amount of customization, more configuration and more rapid upgrade safe nature of kind of technology deployment. Uh, and a uh, lot of uh, sessions that happened throughout the day that many of you guys attended and participated in. Uh, the key themes I would highlight here is from my perspective, what I felt was there is absolute clarity of direction now on what needs, what GRC brings to the table. There are a lot of battlefield scars of the do's and don'ts and the practices that we have uh, em embarked on. And, and I think it's, it's about really kind of figuring out it's not just the technology, but it's also the culture, the business, and how you partner up on the business side to bring things together. That's going to be an important imperative going forward. The technology is just a tool. 
Uh, it provides the basics, but how we use it is going to determine the success or the failure uh, of GRC programs in the future. And I want to leave with this final thought of a lot of lot was talked about how AI is going to be brought to GRC, but I want to also bring a reverse question how GRC should be brought to AI. And I want to leave you with this thought today. As I said, it's not just AI for GRC, it's how does GRC be brought to AI. So imagine a world where you have hundreds of thousands of employees in an organization, but equally importantly, there may be hundreds of thousands of bots in the organization, and we have to move beyond human errors to errors done by the bots, biases brought by the bots, and how do you regulate the bots themselves. So we are not far away from that world where GRC programs have to bring the governance and risk management and compliance to the world of AI and bots. And I think we've got to start to think about beyond the human error into the world of bots. So I think as we finish the day today, I, I would leave that thought in this world of continuous cognitive and uh, cloud and how GRC kind of moves into the next level. Uh, so, so that's a, just a high-level synthesis for the day today. And I want to thank you, Harit, for your insightful comments. I really gained a lot just hearing your story over the last 30, 40 years. And as I said, the last 15, we've been building GRC. We still have a long way to go, but thank you for your insight. Thank and you. thank you all for a great day today. We'll see you for the cocktail. Thank you.